Hello, everyone. I think everyone um, can probably see me now. Please let me know if you can hear me and see me. All right, awesome. So guys, welcome to our third event. It's our final event uh, for our global startup tour. Uh, the whole premise of this is we are traveling, you know, virtually around the world to hear about uh, SaaS startups and SaaS ecosystems. So the first week we were in Europe and we went to London and Munich and uh, Slovenia and Poland. And then the second week we went to North America where we heard from experts in Vancouver, San Francisco, Denver. Um, and then now we're at APAC. This is our final tour. So uh, thanks for all the panelists who are joining today. Uh, we have Singapore, Hong Kong, Bangalore, and we have Sydney. And so and thanks for everyone attending as well, you guys who are in the audience. Um, some people may not uh, be able to join today live, but this is being recorded. So uh, this, if you want to watch this later, we're going to upload it on YouTube and put the link in the same um, in the same link for for the event page. So if you if you found the event page, uh, sastock.com slash whatever, go to the same link and you'll find the video once we're all done. Um, a few other things I want to mention. Uh, if at any time you have a question for the panelists, you can just type it into the chat box. So if you click on chat, you can enter a question there. You can also click on Q&A and ask a question there. And if you're too shy, then you can just send it to me privately um, and I will ask the panelists for you. So why are we doing this event? Um, I've mentioned it in the previous uh, previous tours in Europe and North America, but the reason is there's a lot of people here in Korea who are still a bit unfamiliar with SaaS. They may they may have heard about it, but the SaaS scene here is still growing at the early stages. There are some great SaaS companies, but it's not you know super super uh, well developed here as as is hardware or fintech or bio. So we're trying to help grow the SaaS scene here by having these little casual events, talking to some experts around the world, and hopefully, you know, get people to be more interested in the SaaS scene uh, and to create a SaaS company. So, yeah, uh, without further ado, I'm going to invite our very first speaker. That is Belinda from Hong Kong. So, Belinda, I'm going to give you presenter mode. I know you're a host as well, but... I'm going to go ahead and bring her on stage. And while she's getting ready, oh, there you are. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, by the way, is, yeah. sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I was just like, just go ahead. Yeah. So last time I had, uh, you know, a Wi-Fi issue, but hopefully that's fixed. Um, please let me know if, you know, the Wi-Fi is weird. But, um, yeah, hopefully it's working well. So, so yeah, uh, Belinda. You know, you've, you've been living in Hong Kong for quite a while. So um, whenever you're ready, uh, I will turn off my camera and I'll let you get started. Thank you. Thank you so much. And everybody, as Jonathan mentioned, if you have any questions, please just drop them there. Because what I'm giving you now is a really high level overview of um, what's going on in Hong Kong. Let me just quickly share my screen with you. So, yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan, for really yeah, taking us all around the world. I'm Sasdok's head of APEC, and my name is Belinda. I'm based in Hong Kong. If you wonder where my accent is from, I'm born and raised in Austria, and I've been in Hong Kong now for five years. I'm actually half Hong Kong, half Austrian. So before that, I also lived in the Philippines and in Australia, so the past eight years I spent all over Asia and I'm um, yeah, really aware of what's going on like within the startup scene in Asia. So today we're talking about Hong Kong and also touching upon China because obviously that's always get mentioned um, almost in the same sentence. So why Hong Kong? What makes Hong Kong so special? So if you're starting a startup, um, Hong Kong is a great place to start a company because um, the taxes are really low and the government really, really pushes um, the startup um, 
industry and also startups to um yeah they really really um want to have more startups in hong kong so they're really helpful um generally speaking yeah apart from the low taxes the startup ecosystem in hong kong is really collaborative um meaning that people really go out of their way to actually help you everybody speaks almost everybody speaks english and um, really well so english is definitely and um, the business language so um there's no language barrier in um hong kong um, obviously that's like louder for Hong Kong. I'm going to go into China in a second, but in Hong Kong, why Hong Kong is a great place to also start a SaaS company is because of also talent. So there's a lot of talent in Hong Kong, whether it's developers or, you know, just like really great people from all over the world. So a lot of people come here to look for a co-founder, look for a team to really build the company. Hong Kong has a lot of um, smaller SaaS startups um, there's not been one big uh, unicorn yet um, in terms of SaaS, but um, again, it's really, really growing. For example, uh, an example I can name, for example, is Airwallex, which is based uh, in Melbourne, but they also now move um, the quarter to Hong Kong. And they're a great example of, uh, you know, just somebody who really wants to look more into um, Hong Kong and also China now. Um, yeah, Hong Kong has eight unicorns. Um, a lot of them are, for example, um, e-commerce. Um, yeah, lots of e-commerce going on in Hong Kong. And um, yeah, most companies, uh, with the exception of mainland China ones, think international first. So if people set up a company in Hong Kong, they don't just cater to um, the Hong Kong market, but they really look into um, international markets. International meaning, and uh, this could be, uh, you know, US, Europe, or the rest of Asia. But we all know, um, being based in Asia, that the market is really fragmented all over Southeast Asia. So it's really more looking into the English speaking um, international markets. Great examples in Hong Kong of uh, SaaS companies are TalkPush and ShopLine. Again, we can uh, share in these slides and these notes with you afterwards, but these are ShopLine is basically Asia's Shopify. Um, they um, have um, yeah, received amazing investment. They're speaking also next week at Sastok APEC and Talk Push also previously spoke at Sastok Asia. So there are two really great examples of um, companies uh, being set up in Hong Kong and really looking at international markets. Again, um, low taxes and also Hong Kong being um, really international and the language being English makes it really attractive um, for businesses to set up uh, here. And also having been all over Asia, I really must say that um, Hong Kong is amazing in terms of um, the whole like collaborative ecosystem. I think Hong Kong is one of the places with the most co-working spaces, um, like within um, a certain radius. And yeah, there's really like a co-working space at yeah every corner that you can look into and um, same with like startups um, apart from SaaS does a lot of um, fintech startups in Hong Kong and also e-commerce is really booming too because Hong Kong is only um, a 50 minute um, train ride away from Shenzhen which is basically the Silicon Valley of um, China and Greater Bay. So Shenzhen is really famous for hardware. So a lot of people are also based in Hong Kong and they just go on, that was post uh, pre-COVID, they just go on day trips to Shenzhen and just sort out their business, whether it's manufacturing um, or anything related to hardware or tech stuff and just come back here. So um, just to quickly touch upon China, um, China is, um, although, you know, we're just, yeah, next to each other, um, China is really different in terms of start the whole startup scene compared to Hong Kong. Um, it starts with the language, but uh, generally speaking, um, when it comes to SaaS, SaaS has become the leading enterprise software model of choice in China. Um, so it's really, really booming, but it's really, really fragmented in China. Um, so yeah, super fragmented. Many of China's um, SaaS market verticals, um, they're really um, more suited for domestic rather than international providers. So usually with China um, to um, the West, they look um, around and see what fits and then just make it fit for their market. So 
thing we see in China, but China is definitely um, booming when it comes to SaaS. Um, so uh, here's an example in terms of SaaS market size and growth rate um, for China that we have here. So um, yeah, as uh, mentioned before, this will be shared with you. Um, yeah, and you can see the growth rate and also the opportunities. And again, with Hong Kong, you know, being just next to China and just a train right away, um, especially in times when you can travel, Hong Kong is re makes it really attractive for people um, to be um, stationed in. And if they need to get a business done in China, they just quickly go for a day or two and then just come back here to Hong Kong. Because also Hong Kong has a lot of um, tech companies that are um, headquartered here or have a bigger office here. So that's also one of the reasons why if you look into having a more international business, Hong Kong makes much more sense than China. But if you have a, a business that's really focused on China, you obviously need to be in China. Um, so yeah, these are the most active SaaS investors um, that are really relevant, I would say, in um, China and Hong Kong. Um, so yeah, again, will be shared with you. Obviously, Alibaba um, Entrepreneurs Fund, they're also really, really active here in Hong Kong. Same with Tencent um, to also really, really flourish and um, the whole like startup ecosystem. And they also organize a lot of events. I think event-wise also, apart from SASTOG, um, there's a lot of um, tech events um, going on in Hong Kong. Previously, there was RISE conference, which was really basically Asia's biggest um, uh, conference. And also there's um, Start Me Up Festival hosted by um, Invest Hong Kong, which belongs to the government in Hong Kong, where they have over 17,000 17, attendees. So there's quite a few um, bigger um, uh, conferences here in Hong Kong. And in the past also we had Slush in Shenzhen, in Shanghai, but yeah, in Shenzhen also um, pre-COVID, there were also a lot of uh, events up and coming. So yeah, that was a really, really brief overview about the SaaS scene in Hong Kong. Um, please connect with me. You can also find me next week at our SaaS stock APEC conference. If you're keen to join, I'll also drop you a discount code. And yeah, please connect with me. And uh, yeah, do we have any questions? So um, I asked a few before to um, send the questions during the, the, the panel at the end. And mm -hmm. I've got a few questions already that have been delivered to me. So I'll ask those to everyone uh, during the panel time. And we'll just go ahead and move on to the next person. However, okay. I want you to mention one more time uh, for everyone that, you know, Belinda is in charge of all of APAC at SAS Talk, And she has organized this really big event next week. Um, could you give a few more details on that? Yes. Let me share. Yeah. So, um, I will share. I will share it before the panel because I will just get the link um, ready and also the uh, discount code. Yeah, let's move on right now and yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right then. Thank you, Belinda. See you. See you soon. Okay. So Belinda is gone. And now next we're going to hear from uh, Ajit in Singapore. So I'm going to put you on the screen. All right, while well, he's getting his camera set up. Oh, hello, good afternoon, or good evening. Hey, 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 good evening. Thanks, Belinda. Great. Jonathan. Great to be yeah, here. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, everyone's really excited about Singapore. It seems like many people have questions specifically for Singapore, um, but I'll, I'll get to those later. Um, you know, thanks for joining, and uh, tell us a little bit about, about you and what you do. Um, yeah. Great, yeah. So uh, I work for a small uh, seed stage venture capital fund uh, headquartered in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I work for the Singapore office and we, have, we invest across Southeast Asia, Tokyo, as well as in India. Uh, we primarily invest into SaaS companies, actually. So, you know, both uh, B2B uh, global SaaS companies, as well as SaaS companies that are more focused on emerging markets. Um, and uh, yeah, like uh, we're quite tech agnostic as a whole, um, you know, invest uh, as early as possible into a very early stage company. Um, All right. Thanks for that introduction. And I'm going to go ahead and get off the screen and let you do your thing. Awesome.
Great. Um, yeah, so I think maybe I'll just quickly start with a bit of background, right? And um, I know I know a lot of you have already seen this this slide, but of course, you know, this is the this is the reality that we're facing um, every day right now, which is in total number of COVID cases, and that's going on at full pace. Um, but one thing that I guess a lot of you, especially working in SaaS, would have noticed is that you know the cloud 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 companies, public cloud companies, don't seem to be affected by uh, this pandemic, right? Like they are, uh, if you look at the Bessemer Venture Partner uh, Emerging Cloud Index, that's really on a tear. Uh, so if you had put in a, a dollar there, like you'd, you know, you'd be way, way higher than the S S S and P 500, um, you would have made your returns. Um, and, and, it, and this is across the board, right? This is not just, uh, COVID-related companies like Zoom, but also Shopify, DocuSign, all of these are doing really, really well uh, in term, in the public markets. One of the main reasons why this is happening is not just because of, uh, of you know, these are these are going to uh, these companies are are on a tear and are growing, but mostly because their, their revenues are growing, right? Uh, their revenues are growing not just because of COVID, but they, they're expected to grow even further and beyond COVID. Uh, the Revenue of public cloud com cloud companies are almost expected to touch three hundred fifty billion dollars in just in a couple of years, um, and the private markets are not far behind. Actually, if you look at it, just in the in the first half of twenty twenty, seventeen billion dollars went into SaaS companies alone for uh, venture capital money that went into SaaS companies alone, um, and twenty nineteen saw a record year of thirty one billion dollars pumped into SaaS companies. Um, and why is that, right? And if you if you think about it. it you know, the average spend uh, of SaaS that we saw, like we've, we've done a bit of research and we saw, found that about $8,000 per, per employee is spent on uh, SaaS products in mid-market companies globally, right? And that's a huge amount of money. If you, if you look at uh, the split of SaaS spending by department, there's uh, sales and marketing, there's R&D, there's G&A. Uh, and if you just look at the these three public companies and if you break down their SaaS spending, you can clearly see that it's increasing year on year as the company scales. So it's not slowing down anytime soon. Um, and coming to Singapore, right? Uh, what what what? Where does Singapore stand in all of this? And if you think about it, like uh, if you you would have heard a number of uh, uh, Singapore, the government in Singapore, just like in Hong Kong, the government has spend quite a bit of uh, resources and energy trying to attract top quality talent. In fact, recently, I don't know if you would have heard, there's, um, there's been a new uh, visa created, visa category created for global leaders, tech leaders uh, that are working in pretty large cap companies like 500 million valuation above to move to Singapore to set up their base in Singapore. And this is mostly for knowledge sharing uh, to encourage the ecosystem overall. Um, not only that, you have companies uh, you have companies that uh, are present in India or companies that are present in uh, other parts of Southeast Asia that want to be headquartered in Singapore just because of the safety, security. Um, and and, and on, to on top of that, the Singapore government also has a pass for early stage entrepreneurs called Entre, Entre Pras. And as long as you um, have a company set up for, I think, uh, with about $50,000 of paid up capital, uh, you'd be able to get a visa to set up shop in Singapore as a, as a, as a young entrepreneur. Um, and not only that, the Singapore government also has funding schemes uh, that they can encourage you to start your, uh, to start your own companies as long as you have a Singapore-based uh, co-founder. So uh, this has been happening for almost now about 15 years now. Um, and this has definitely had some level of uh, success, right? So, you know, we do have a few notable exits. Uh, Pi, which got acquired by Google, TradeGecko, that recently got acquired by Intuit. Uh, TradeGecko is an ERP software. Uh, WaveCell is in the infrastructure uh, play, and they, they got acquired by 8 by 8 recently, also last year. So, you know, definitely on the exit side, uh, slowly starting to pick up. Uh, while uh, also, a number of growing SaaS companies, right? You have Capillary, you have Trax. Trax is a retail analytics company. Descara is an ERP software. Vsense and Tiger are both in the AI space. Uh, actually, all three on the right side are in the AI space. Um, and this is starting to really pick up, right? And one of the things that we've seen um, in Singapore is this presence of uh, APAC leaders of global SaaS companies. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, what this has enabled people to do is to build 
uh, a lot of AI products for these global SaaS companies that have presence in Singapore, right? And and sell sell um, AI as well as SaaS com- products to them. Uh, have a ready user base instead of selling directly to the US or EU or UK market, they sell uh, to the Singapore market. Uh, and of course, yes, uh, you know SaaS funding in Singapore has also been growing, right? Like, and it's reflective of global trends. Uh, almost half a billion dollars went into, uh, more than half a billion more dollars went into uh, SaaS company funding in Singapore. Um, and in in 2020, definitely because of COVID, there's, there's been a slump in terms of funding, but it has not uh, gone significantly lower than, uh, than, uh, than 2019. And and one key thing, right over here, and I, this is this is my last slide, and I want one one key thing that I want to leave with you uh, in terms of uh, why Singapore and why uh, why why should you be building a SaaS company based out of Singapore, is this right? This slide here, right? Uh, if you look at it, these are some of the global SaaS companies, global cloud companies, um, and all of them have significant presence in Singapore. And these are customer success, these are sales and marketing teams, these are customer support teams, uh, even finance teams, and sometimes even product and engineering teams, right? And if you're building a SaaS company or SaaS product uh, that is targeting any of these verticals, uh, it's amazing that you already have a ready user base in Singapore itself directly, where you can get product feedback. And not only that, have connects to the global HQ, just from the Singapore head- headquartered office, right? Um, and I think that's what really, uh, Gets us excited about 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 this and also about the SaaS ecosystem in Singapore, right? And definitely SaaS Talk has been helping to uh, connect with that ecosystem here. So yeah, I'll just uh, I think I'll just take a pause over here and and see uh, maybe move on to some of the questions that uh, you guys have so that I I can be more uh, relevant to what you guys have. So first of all, I want to answer um, Svetlana's question. Can we get the presentation after? So this will. Oh, sure being recorded and we will put the link up so uh, you can watch the um, the video rec- uh, recording uh, session probably by tomorrow morning. Uh, now it's, you know, about 7.30 Korea time. Uh, as far as the slides, if, um, if the panelists want to send me their slides, I can probably put the link on there as well so you guys can access that. So um, yeah, just FYI. So um, one question for Ajith. Um, uh, the other questions I think we'll ask during the panel, but um, because of Corona, you know, there's been some news about, um, you know, the government kind of like, you know, limiting the number of visas for foreign people wanting to go there. And do you know anything about that as far as people who want to set up their their, their companies in Singapore or people who just want to uh, relocate there? Got it. Uh, I can't speak on behalf of the government, obviously, but like I can see, you know, um, uh, definitely there's been some curbs on people movement in the near term, and that's more related to whether your country is in the travel list or no travel list or in a travel bubble, right? But in terms of the overall immigration or passes, especially for the entrepreneurs, I don't think that's slowing down uh, anytime soon, right? Like you still have the same passes. Uh, that are available for entrepreneurs who want to come here and set up shop. Uh, if you go to the ICA website or uh, there's a website, let me let me send that uh, website to you guys, right? Um, link that in the chat later. But uh, if you go to the Startup SG website, that'll give you a lot of the uh, uh, key information required to see what, what you'd need to do to get the entrepreneur pass. Um, and not only Entrepreneur Pass, you also have uh, two or three accelerators in Singapore, uh, like Ent- Entrepreneur First, Antler, that when you apply to them, and if you do get into those accelerator programs, even if you don't have a startup and you just have an idea, you want to become an entrepreneur, then they'd apply for those passes for you to bring you into Singapore. So um, uh, yes, there are some curbs on people movement in the near term because of whether your country has a lot of COVID cases or not, but in terms of the actual passes or limiting the number of passes, that's not changing anytime soon. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Ajit. Uh, we'll hear more from you during the panel, and I will um, yeah talk to you soon. Great. Thanks. All right. I'm going to bring up our next speaker, Saswat from Bangalore. So while he gets his camera turned on, uh, we'll welcome him to the stage. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, uh, Jonathan. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for joining. For, for everyone who doesn't know, uh, he is the city leader of SASDOC in Bangalore. And can, can you tell us a little bit about what else you do? Sure. 
Uh, my name is Ashwit Sahu. I'm currently based out of Bangalore. I'm an uh, international management consultant, had uh, multiple stints in the UK, US, Middle East, Latin America, and then finally, I'm grounded in my home base in Bangalore. Uh, I love this city because of the tech talent over here, and uh, the weather is quite pleasant over here as well. It's a little bit warmer, maybe close to Hong Kong, and a little bit warmer from Seoul as well as Sydney. So uh, I uh, consult uh, with a lot of SaaS startups out here in Bangalore and India, as well as I'm a NASCOM fellow, which is an overarching body for all the IT as well as software companies currently operating out of India uh, towards the globe as well. Great, thanks for the intro. I've actually heard from many people in India that Bangalore has the best weather. I I've heard that <laughs> consistently, so that's, uh, that's really cool. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and let you get started. So um, yeah, excited to hear more about Bangalore. Sure. So I'll just share my screen and uh, I hope that is available for everyone. So um, just to give you a little bit of context around SaaS, I think um, India as well as um, Bangalore specifically has a lot of history to uh, SaaS coming from uh, the software origins. It started from 2000 onwards where uh, government wise and country wise, there was a lot of uh, engineers operating out of India going to different parts of the globe. Uh, currently, India has lot, uh, close to three and a half million uh, software engineers and 100K um, SaaS engineers to be specific. Now, as you can see over here, uh, these are the global SaaS trends and everyone knows about it, that Americas is the largest market and these are the specific verticals starting from BFSI, uh, retail, healthcare and education. But coming to India, what's so specific is that uh, we had uh, roughly three and a half billion dollars of revenues in 2020 and it's growing at a CGR of 30%, which is like way higher. And um, we project that in the coming five years, there will be revenues stopping to close to 15 billion as well. Uh, the SaaS ecosystem is very mature. I mean, it's, it's not as mature as America's uh, or some other parts, but uh, it, in the Asian economy, we already have six, six, six uh, SaaS unicorns. We started off with the old unicorns like um, Zoho, Isertes, and then we move to High Radius, uh, Freshworks, Druva, and the most recent uh, unicorn that we hosted in one of our SaaS talk event was also uh, Postman. Uh, so Postman uh, was the latest unicorn, and somehow the NASCOM predictions are that, that in the coming two to three years, we'll have another five to 10 unicorns operating out of India, uh, getting into that unicorn realm. Uh, emergence of new unicorns um, and players adopting the disruptive strategies and exploring new technologies, geographies, and customer segments. Uh, now, what makes Indian SaaS industry very unique is because of the talent pool. As I rightly mentioned, we have a history of software engineers. Uh, by default, a lot of engineering graduates move into IT companies, as well as a lot of uh, management talent moves into IT companies. Now, what happens is that uh, very early on, people are exposed to the software ecosystem. They eventually immigrate or migrate to US, UK, other parts of Europe, even to uh, Singapore, Australia, and Korea. And, uh, and uh, the ecosystem is very mature. Uh, many of the tech talent uh, for the last two and a half, three years have been coming back to Bangalore specifically. Uh, and there was a reverse migration happening. And now this tech talent, along with a lot of new age startup founders, are uh, fr framing and forming new companies as well. So the ecosystem is strong and there's a, a supportive government in place as well. And uh, there's a lot of accelerators, whether it is national level accelerators or international accelerators like the YCs, as well as Mass Challenge, uh, Antler, uh, like our friends suggested, Entrepreneur First, all operating out of Bangalore. Uh, the Bangalore is also a testbed for innovation and there's a huge domestic consumption market and deep tech adoption. Globally, we know for sure that there's a lot of B2B software or SaaS companies that play, but there's also a little bit of um, B2C uh, SaaS companies operating out of uh, India. Uh, if I were to give you a little bit of um, uh, background and context to that, uh, roughly uh, for every B2C company that is sprouting out of India, of the uh, roughly 100 odd companies, which have uh, one million dollars uh, of uh, ARR. Uh, roughly 1.6 companies are in the B2B segment. So obviously B2B is way higher as opposed to B2C. Uh, 
Uh, of course, we have a very strong SaaS heritage and uh, strong experience in sectors like BFSI, retail, AIML, and CRM. Uh, the market opportunity and the playbooks have been um, uh, publicly available as well. And uh, the projections, everyone is aware that in this um, you know, post-corona or COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, world, uh, there's a lot of digital acceleration that has happened. So almost 10 years or a decade of uh, things have been concise to for the last seven to eight months of operation. So what will happen is that in the next two, three years, uh, back in 2008, 9, 10, when we saw Slack coming up, Stripe coming up in the U.S. Valley area, now, now the Silicon Valley is on the cloud. So there's a lot of companies that are already operating in the cloud native uh, gig economy. They're already operating the SaaS model. So uh, it would be uh, no surprise if there would be a lot of uh, SaaS companies uh, coming out in the next three to five years. And many of these SaaS companies will have their roots in India as well. Uh, India uh, and more specifically Bangalore has a strong product background, meaning that a lot of product managers, product engineers are operating out of this ecosystem. And uh, we foresee that the combined mix of product teams, management teams, and, uh, and the so software folks will accelerate the SaaS um, ecosystem. So that's, uh, this is a slide pad that is available on the internet, and I can share the link with Jonathan as well as my other uh, friends on the call. Uh, so that's a brief about uh, the Indian uh, ecosystem. Great. Thanks for that. Um, I do have one question to ask you before you leave. Um, Someone asked me privately, um, where was the question? Uh, ah, do people in Bangalore, do most people in Bangalore speak English? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that's a question that many, uh, many of our international friends uh, happen to ask us. Uh, India primarily has uh, multiple states with uh, their own, uh, own languages as well. But uh, the, the working professionals uh, and uh, people who are well-educated, everyone speaks English. So if you come down to Bangalore and you want to uh, be active in the startup ecosystem or would love to engage with folks from uh, the tech background, from the management background, everyone speaks English. So much so that the colloquial language amongst, um, you know, between on Slack channels or on our phone calls is also English because we all speak multiple other mother tongues as well. Right. I, I've actually been to Bangalore once and I can attest to that. I had, I had no problems. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next speaker and we'll see you in about 15 minutes uh, during the group panel. So thanks again. Uh, okay. I'm going to remove him from the screen real quick. And our next speaker, it's our last speaker actually for the night is Cheryl. Cheryl, I'm going to set you, uh, actually I hit the wrong button. All right, Cheryl, you should be coming up on the screen now. Let's give her a moment to probably turn on her camera. Um, Cheryl comes from a city. Oh, there you are. <laughs> There's about 12 bucks I had to push. Can everyone see? Hello? Yeah, we can see you. Uh, that happened to me the first time, too. Okay. Do you to, yes, do you want to restart your browser? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. yes. Hi, feeling? everyone. Great. Well, it's great for you to join. Uh, and thanks, Belinda, for the, the link you just sent just now as well. Um, so before we get started, I have a question for you, Cheryl. Um, you live in Sydney, but I, I saw yeah. somewhere in your bio that you're also Canadian. So can you give us a little <laughs> introduction? Yeah. There? Yes. Um, so you might notice I not have an accent. However, it is deceiving because I am, in fact, Australian. The issue is that my parents left Australia um, when they were about my age around the world and landed in Canada halfway through and forgot to go back to Australia. So they had me there and I was born there. And then 24 years later, I thought, well, I've got the passport. Well, uh, and <laughs> all right. Okay. That's cool. All right. Well, I'll let you introduce yourself and, uh, and, and get on with your, with your little introduction to Sydney. Yes. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Possibly. There we go. This one. Excellent. 
All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sydney, Australia um, on a fantastic day. Um, or other things happening, it's it's uh, it's not so great. Um, but for the most part, I live a very fun life. Uh, so uh, my name is Cheryl. I'm currently the national head of community at Stone and Chalk. Stone and Chalk is an impact network with three physical hubs in Adelaide. We exist um, to support startups and help them catalyze uh, their success by connecting them to customers, capital, talent, expertise, and community. And I have the most amazing job in the world because I basically just get to um, sit around all day thinking about how we can help the startups succeed better. Um, and so we've got about 200 startups in our portfolio. Uh, we've had about 150 graduate, and overall, they've uh, raised over 550 million over the last five years that we've been operating. Um, so, if you want to learn more about Stone and Chalk, please reach out. Um, and my background is basically startups. I've worked for startups my entire life. Um, I'm also an angel investor, and uh, I basically spend my life um, connecting and supporting founders because I believe that um, founders are going to save the world. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about Sydney. Uh, so we are uh, above the global average in, term of, in terms of software startup output, which is uh, awesome. Uh, we, however, we're a little bit under on the uh, early stage funding, and I'll go, in, go into funding a little bit more in a moment. Um, our ecosystem value, though, is super high, and I like to think that I've contributed to that a little bit over the years that I've been here. Um, so just touching on that, we, we are, um, you know, we're, we're a strong ecosystem, but we still have a long way to go. We've got some fantastic companies, and I think we're we're putting we're getting some more wins on the board, which is um, really great. And we've seen uh, we currently have four real unicorns, so privately uh, privately owned companies that are valued at over one billion dollars. And those four at the moment are Air Wallet, Safety Culture, Culture Amp, and Canva. Now, the interesting thing, though, about um, Sydney, Australia in general, is that um, it's really easy to list on the ASX. And so while we only have four true unicorns, we actually have over 20 companies that are valued at over a billion dollars. It's just that they are listed. Um, and that's because uh, I would say VCs in Australia... Um, don't let them hear me say this, but um, they are a little bit risk averse. And so sometimes founders opt to go the ASX uh, route instead of their Series A or Series B. Um, so just looking at where some of them have been listed, um, you might recognize some of the names here. Um, but we actually have quite a lot of companies that have been um, that have taken that route in terms of listing as their Series A or Series B rather than staying private. So you might see a lot of companies in the U.S. who stay private way longer than they probably should, um, whereas you don't see that trend here in Australia. And so it's important to note that. Um, and I did also meant, or I did um, put in here, we it's estimated that we've got about 2,500 SaaS startups in Australia. Although um, I would also say that the number of startups in Australia in general is always kind of a, you know, finger in the air kind of number because no one's really measuring them. Um, so I think uh, I think we need, we have a little bit further to go in that regard. Um, so let's talk a little bit about VC funds and VC funding. Um, so we have quite a number of funds. We've got um, you know, several large ones. So Airtree, Blackbird, and SquarePeg all have around a $400 million fund. Uh, and then we've got kind of that next tier that are slightly smaller funds, um, but still do a large majority of the investing. And then what's also interesting is that in Australia, we are starting to see that kind of um, hybrid kind of their much earlier stage. And they kind of are bridging the gap between the angels who are investing, you know, the really early stage, smaller, smaller checks and the VCs. Uh, and they call themselves VCs, but I actually think that they're somewhere in between. Um, you know, we almost need a new name for them because they're kind of they're the ones that are like the syndicates that are bringing together the checks of round 250. And they're the ones that are bridging the round from the angels to the VCs. And I think that's really important. Um, and there's also other models of funding that are coming into Australia as well. We're a little bit um, slow in, in that regard. We tend to get these alternative um, sources of funding a couple of years later than everyone else. Um, but we've just gotten our first funds, um, which is super cool. So I'm really excited about that. A um, little bit more about Australian VC. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of a worrying trend in that uh, the 
amount, like the value, total amount of money that's being invested is going way up. As you can see, it more than doubled from 2017 to 2018, and it's risen again in 2019. However, the number of deals is steadily going down, which means that our VCs in particular are investing in later stage deals. Um, and what that means is that there's less money for the earlier stage deals to um, to get through, which potentially could be harmful for us in the long run. So um, hopefully there will be more angel and seed stage funding that are coming in. Um, but Australia's laws aren't super investor friendly. So we need to fix that. And that's part of my job as well, which is lobbying the government. And then they never listen to me. Um, so just uh, some of our biggest deals that um, went through. And uh, of the list here, I think there's only one that isn't a SaaS company. So um, in Australia, SaaS is really, really prevalent. In fact, uh, if you ask any given VC that you see at the Sydney Startup Pub, which I'll talk about in a minute, on any given day, if you ask them what their investment thesis is, you're nearly guaranteed uh, to hear B2B SaaS. You ask the next one, B2B SaaS. Oh, what do you invest in? B2B SaaS. Um, it's pretty much it's pretty much everyone's investment thesis uh, here in Australia, which is good and bad in lots of different ways. Uh, we also have a lot of corporate. Well, I wouldn't say a lot, actually. We do have some corporate venture funds. Uh, and unfortunately, some of these have closed down. Um, for example, Qantas Ventures was alive for like 12 months. Uh, and that didn't survive. But a couple of the others have survived and do quite a lot of investment. For example, Telstra Ventures has been around for like seven years now and they've done um, you know, over like 50 deals, which is fantastic. So we like to see this um, in a good ecosystem. Uh, we've also got quite a few accelerators and incubators. Um, and after this, after I'm done this presentation, which you'll get the slides as well, I do have a list of all of these uh, along with a lot of other resources for Australia. So I can send that out um, for you guys. Uh, what you're seeing here uh, is that we do have some niche ones, which I think is a sign of a good ecosystem as well, that we're starting to see some of these niche ones pop up, um, for example, like energy or just for females. So what do we do really well? Uh, well, we're really good at fintech. Uh, you probably know that Australia was the first place where the chip for the pin card um, was invented, and so was Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, and so yeah, we, we do fintech really well. A lot of fintech SaaS out there. Um, a lot of consumer fintech as well. Um, it's also why the, a lot of a lot of the neo banks are using Australia as a test ground. So it's really fun moving your money around between different places. Um, but yeah, that's us. Let's continue. Uh, we do have some government support, uh, probably not nearly as much as some of the others that you've hear, heard here tonight. Um, like Singapore, we just cannot even come close to um, the, the government support that Singapore provides. But we do have uh, we do have some good options. So the government does provide quite a few grants. And uh, the MVP grant is a really good one. Um, and we do get tax credits as well for R&D which I think is also awesome. Um, so the one thing I do want to touch on, which I think is really um, awesome about the Sydney ecosystem, is that we have something called the Sydney Startup Hub. So this was an initiative by the New South Wales government nearly four years ago. Um, so essentially, they bought out this building um, in the central business district, and they named it the Sydney Startup Hub. And basically, what's included there is three... No, four um, innovation hub co-working spaces, which is Fish Burner, Stone and Chalk, that's where I work, the studio and Tank Stream. Uh, there's also three corporate accelerators, so Microsoft, Optus, and Caltex, and then two government innovation um, precincts. So all within this one building uh, are all of these entrepreneurs that are coming together. And like I said, um, SaaS is very, very prevalent in Australia. So I would say like at least 80% of the companies that are here is probably um, SaaS companies, which is really fantastic. Um, but it's really created um, a cluster of, uh, of knowledge and a lot of, a lot of really good value exchange that has happened here. So I, this was a fantastic effort by the government. Um, so these were just some stats within the first 12 months. It's from 2018, but they didn't do it again in uh, 2019. So I only have these numbers. But as you can see, there's there's just been some really positive outcomes from having everyone in this one building. So congrats on our government for doing that. Um, the other one I wanted to point out is that we are increasing uh, commercialization. And so a lot of the universities have started their own startup programs, which has uh, 
basically increased our ability to commercialize um, in Australia because we consistently rank last in OECD in terms of commercialization. Um, so this is looking really good for us. And that just means that we are, um, you know, putting hopefully going to be getting some more wins on the board. That's about it for me. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them and I will uh, provide you with the list that I mentioned that basically has everything that you need to know uh, about the Australian startup ecosystem. All right, thanks, Cheryl. Uh, that was great. Um, so um, let me see. Uh, I'm gonna bring everyone else on the screen real quick so we can all kind of talk together. So Belinda, you're coming up. Jason's coming up, okay. Okay, here we are. I think that's everyone. There should be five of us total. All right, so. Okay, cool. Everyone's here. So my, uh, my first, oh, we're going to have so anyone else. You can start asking questions now uh, so we can see them. The first one actually Belinda, for Belinda, because someone asked it a few minutes ago, um, they asked in the Q&A section, Belinda, will the Rise event be in Hong again? So Rise is going virtual next year. Going virtual. Okay. I mean, it's um, so virtual rise is happening next year in March. Um, yeah, it's online, unfortunately. You know why. <laughs> okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, um, I know Casey's been, you know, talking about that a lot, uh, promoting, um, well, Web Summit, which is, you know, also being all online. But okay, that, that answers the question. Sure. And uh, Jessica, yes, you can leave the question there. That's people chatting. Um, we actually asked this question earlier, but um, someone asked if people speak English in Bangalore. So yes, uh, again, they, they, they do. That was the, do you want to say anything else about that? I think uh, India primarily has a lot of um, English speaking uh, people and uh, especially in the SaaS and the you know, software ecosystem, uh, English is a global language. So obviously you have to speak English if you were to communicate with uh, folks from all parts of the world. And uh, especially in the SaaS world, a lot of uh, people are talking uh, to international customers, engineers, product managers, et cetera. So in English is the language franca. Great. All right, thanks for that. Uh, to Cheryl, someone uh, DM'd me privately and said, Cheryl is amazing, super useful stuff. Um, you mentioned investors mostly invest in B2B mostly. What is the reason for this? Maybe I missed it in case you did mention it. That is a fantastic question. I did not answer it. And the reason I didn't answer it is um, largely don't have a good answer. Um, so if you ask them their thesis, why, why, why is that your thesis? Um, a lot of them come up with reasons like, well, um, you know, we like, we like companies that solve boring, uh, difficult problems. Or, well, we, we have a lot of experience in B2B, so that's our area of expertise. Um, the reality is my secret um, opinion again don't tell them um, I, I actually think we <laughs> investors in Australia are very risk averse and con consumer is scary it's way scarier than b2b because consumers are fickle and things can go viral or they can you know get dumped in the last month's top app thing in a second um, whereas b2b is, is perceived as slightly more safe um, but that's my personal theory cool uh, this is a very interesting one. If a startup wants to make an, uh, an HQ in Asia, which city is better, Hong Kong or Singapore? Ajit, uh, get your boxing gloves out. <laughs> to Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm from Bangalore, so. Um, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, what a small days, world. Yeah. In terms of where to go, it really depends what you're doing. Even SaaS is not just SaaS. So I think there's no clear answer, but also it depends. And I also always say go where you can have the best chances to get funding, as in government funding or also funding schemes. So that's also something to consider. Singapore, and um, Ajit mentioned it too, Singapore's SaaS ecosystem is much more evolved um, compared to Hong Kong. But for example, if your business focuses on China eventually, or if you need hardware there or something, it makes much more sense. But it really depends. Ajit, yeah, I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, I would totally uh, like. I guess you know the answer. Like anything else, it it depends. Um, because I guess you know in Singapore it's really easy to start up. Like you can literally go online within. It takes you less than five minutes actually to start a company in Singapore. Right, like spend thirty dollars and you can you have a you have a, 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 a in a mm-hmm. Singapore Inc. registered company basically. So it, it's really really easy. Uh, the government makes it really easy to file taxes or uh, do your audits. It, everything is uh, online. Like KYCs are super easy. Uh, but at the same time, um, talent is harder to come by here. Uh, you know, you do have some uh, def- definitely hiring uh, foreigners. Uh, you know, like Jonathan alluded to earlier, it's a bit, a little bit harder here because it's harder to get uh, visas uh, for uh, for really good uh, quality talent. Um, and uh, and com- for example, compared to our portfolio companies in in Bangalore, which are able to hire much easier compared to our portfolio companies in Singapore. Right? In fact, some of our portfolio companies in Singapore have. Uh, a tech team also in Bangalore uh, because it's easier to hire there, good engineers there. So uh, yeah, it entirely depends. But at the same time, if you're looking at say uh, trying to go after like the B2B ecosystem in Southeast Asia and emerging markets like Indonesia, uh, Thailand, uh, then yes, definitely you know being in Singapore is probably better than being in Hong Kong because uh, there's a lot more uh, cross-pollination from these ecosystems compared, compared to Hong Kong, which is further out, which is closer to China there. So yeah, uh, if you're Southeast Asia focused or globally focused SaaS, I would say definitely Singapore is probably slightly, has a slight edge compared to Hong Kong. Um, I was actually gonna follow up and ask about Bangalore because I, 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 I've heard there's lots of talent there, obviously, um, and it's probably great to hire uh, you know engineers specifically, right? So I mean, you kind of just answered it, so. Sorry, uh, you, Ajit already answered. Sorry, Sasha. Represent- Sorry, Sasha. That was probably your <laughs> domain, but uh, yeah. right. I think you know, in terms of uh, you know, setting up a headquarter, it makes logical sense to be based out of Singapore, and uh, many of the Indian uh, founders and SaaS enthusiasts know about it. Uh, but in terms of the product team as well as the engineering base, uh, as you rightly mentioned, the uh, tech talent is a little bit, um, how do I put it nicely, a little bit uh, cheaper as opposed to in the valley or in other parts of the world. So because the tech talent is a little bit cheaper, you can build good and um, uh, quicker products and ship it immediately from the Bangalore base. So uh, many, so so one of the parts, many of the SaaS companies are uh, uh, you know, vouching for is that have your company registered in Delaware or, you know, be based out of the Valley area in the U.S. Uh, go after your major B2B customers in the North American geography and have your tech talent or the product, product team based out of Bangalore or India. Perfect. All right. So I do have a lot of questions. So I'm going to start BTS. Um, so, um, yeah, got a few, a lot of questions coming to me privately and a, a few coming to the chat. So let's keep the answers a little bit short to get them get through them. I'm surprised there's so many questions actually. Um, so uh, for Ajit, do you think Singapore startup ecosystem is the most developed in Asia? It's relative, but uh, again, I think, uh, you know, compared to, especially for SaaS, uh, so startup ecosystem overall definitely has, there's a lot more um, funding available in Singapore, like, but a lot fewer uh, entrepreneurs, right? Like, and, and, and not as many entrepreneurs, not as many startups. A lot of uh, funds that are investing across the region are headquartered. Even like, for example, Sequoia, uh, Sequoia Surge program is headquartered in Singapore. Sequoia's uh, entire India team is head, is based in in Singapore, right? So uh, definitely, from from um, ease of business, it's more developed, but. I would say it's mostly because of its proximity to the region uh, and most amount of activity happens in the region. And I, I would say Bangalore is probably a bit more developed than even Singapore uh, in terms of a uh, startup ecosystem. Uh, uh, the other question, I'm sorry, it was a, there was a cheeky BTS, it was a cheeky answer. Uh, <laughs> But I think uh, someone like Line has done really well, right? Like uh, outside of uh, Korea, uh, especially like we had a portfolio company in in Thailand uh, that was doing uh, insurance, and, and they were doing uh, they were working with B two B. They they were in the B two B to C space where they were targeting insurance agents, uh, and they primarily used Line as a as a uh, channel of uh, communication and messaging as well as document management. Uh, so yeah, I, I I guess that's the answer to Jessica's question, but. Happy to hear other people. Uh, next is for Belinda. 
again, asked, how is Hong Kong doing today with political and COVID issues? Do you see more businesses and investors flocking to Singapore? And then the second part is Singapore is small at the end, so that the Johor region in Malaysia is developing fast. You're even developing a new modern city. Do you see Singapore, because of limited space and high cost, do you see people moving maybe to Malaysia? So Belinda, we'll start with you. There's definitely a lot of people, not a lot, but yeah, there's um, definitely few people who are moving to Singapore, but also a lot of people that are just staying here and um, they're just going to monitor the situation and see what's happening. In terms of COVID issues, Hong Kong is doing really well. So um, yeah, there's been eight cases this week and um, the government is freaking out. Um, so yeah, that's how well Hong Kong is doing. Like the most cases we had were 150 a day. That was the max. Um, yeah, so COVID is not really an issue, um, but it's definitely affecting businesses. Um, obviously, the general situation, people are just monitoring it and just, yeah, trying to see what's going to happen. But because also of COVID, everybody's basically also more or less um, stuck at the moment where they are. And people are also, because of COVID, not moving as if they would, COVID wouldn't exist and only um, political situation would be an issue to them. Great. And Ajit, you want to answer the second half of that? Got it. So let me just clarify. So the question is, uh, do I see a Johor picking up vis-a-vis -vis Singapore? Right. Okay, got it. Um, I don't think so. Like, because I think, you know, uh, definitely the Johor government has uh, probably invested quite a bit of money to build like housing and other kind of resources. Uh, but, uh, but like, occupancy has been quite low uh, and especially given like this whole COVID uh, time it, the the ecosystem there has been quite badly hit um, mostly uh, Johor has been more of a, a supply of uh, talent for uh, maybe gray collar workforce in Singapore uh, as well as uh, for service businesses in Singapore has been like a has there's been a constant supply of talent from uh, Johor but tech for the tech industry, not so much, in my opinion. Uh, does that uh, change? Would that change over time? Um, I'm not sure because I think it's still uh, it's still not very easy to commute between. Even though it is like literally across the border, and you know, it probably takes like an hour, uh, but uh, it's still quite far out to, to, to go to Johor compared to being in Singapore and commuting and living in Singapore. Uh, and it's also safer to be in Singapore compared to a place in Singapore. So uh, I don't, in my opinion, no. Uh, so yeah. Okay, great. Um, next we have from Jessica. I heard many Korean startups do not succeed globally because of cultural and language differences. Do you guys know of any Korean startups operating in your cities? Now, to, to, to back this up, um, I work with a lot of Korean startups, and I think this is an issue people are kind of concerned about in Korea. You know, compared to all of your cities, the English-speaking levels are much lower in Korea, right? And so many startups uh, that I consult with, you know, they, they do struggle with going abroad because the founders may not speak English very well. Um, so, yeah, do you guys happen to know any Korean startups operating? in your city. Okay, I guess that answers it. Yeah, no. found us here in Hong Kong, um, but I think of one that's SAS related right now. Uh, okay. But um, definitely, I totally get that, you know, English might be um, a language barrier, but again, Hong Kong, um, for example, makes it really easy. Um, yeah, because English is the language. Yeah. My my BTS answer was actually uh, related to that question. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then I cla <laughs> and then I clarified that actually uh, no, but you know, Line for example is doing really well outside of Korea, right? Um, uh, I know um, uh, Vu Vuwa Brothers. They like they've come out yeah. now, uh, and then like uh, and they've they've also started expanding in Southeast Asia. Um, Right, they started a venture uh, uh, thing that there with uh, with Delivery Hero in Germany, um, right? 
They were yeah. one of our biggest startups until they were acquired last late December of last year. Yeah, but uh, but I guess yeah, I guess you know definitely. Uh, I guess English is definitely one of the issues, right? Like I know somebody who went as a product manager from uh, from Singapore to Korea, and like um, and then basically had was hired along with uh, and given a translator, right? So he's heading up the product team, but has a translator along with him in his all his meetings, who's translating what he's saying to the rest of his team there. So I think that's going to be an issue, uh, uh, I think, as of now. That makes sense. I, I just uh, quickly uh, looked into the unicorns operating out of South Korea. 11, uh, of 11 unicorns, I think $9 billion valuation is Coupon. And I'm pretty sure that Coupon is a well-known name in the Bangalore ecosystem because a lot of product managers are, are either based out of Seoul uh, who have moved from India or there's a lot of engineering team that is uh, doing a little bit of transaction between Seoul and Bangalore, vice versa. Yeah, uh, Coupon is one of the most global startups in Korea because they actually hire, they poach people from Amazon. They're very famous for kind of, uh, you know, I think that they just hired the, the CTO of uh, Uber. Um, yeah, Coupon, I'm pretty sure that was Coupon. Um, so they, they they hire lots of Americans and Amazon. Uh, they have a very big, very global team. So um, one of the questions, let's keep this really short. Are mobile games considered SaaS? Uh, yeah, I think so. It's a uh, you know, mobile device. I'll answer that one. Um, and then, uh, so I have a few that came in to me privately. For all panelists, have you ever been to Korea? Let, let's keep these short. How, how many people have been to Korea? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, only one. Come on. It's time. Okay. I'm going to follow up with that. Do you guys have, because I'm sure some of the guys from Korea are interested. They love talking about, you know, they love asking people if they like Korean food. So do you guys have a, a favorite Korean dish? Cheryl's like, what? what? Pancake. Pancakes. <laughs> pancake. Okay. Korean, so. No, Korean barbecue. Korean barbecue. Okay. I had kimbap for lunch, actually. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Any other foods? Mev says, take time to listen to K-pop and drink soju. <laughs> okay, there you go. Okay, um, I'm trying to see if there's any more questions for Cheryl. Aha, what would you plan to do with StartCon next year? I'll start on 2020. Uh, so I actually resigned from my position of CEO at StartCon uh, in January of 2019. Um, they ran one more event after me. They hired a new CEO and ran one more event after me, and then they shut the company down in 2020. So you know what? I have to say, I think it ran its course. I'm really proud of what I built, and I absolutely had a huge vision for what we could have turned that company into. But at the same time, I think when I think about when we started in 2015, there was basically no startup events. There was a very small ecosystem. There was like, you know, three VC funds. And like, you know, I could count on one hand the number of people that knew what a startup was. Like that's how dire it was. Um, and, and by the time, you know, by 2019, I think like there was 10 different startup events all happening at the same time. Um, there was a million startup like pitch events every night. Like there were just so many conferences and like, just the number of VCs and just it it had it had supported the ecosystem to get where it needed to go and I'm not sure that it was super super needed anymore um so look I'm proud of what I built but I if, I'm happy I wasn't running it so I actually know who asked this question he's the winner of the start con in Korea uh, oh so really that's, that's awesome <laughs> Yeah, I honestly I loved it there. I had so much fun and I was so impressed by the startups in Korea. I would have loved to have taken that pitch competition further, um, but it just wasn't in the cards. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. All right. Uh, let's I have see. A, I have a question for Cheryl. If, if, yeah. Yeah. No, so I, was, I was wondering about uh, about the talent uh, ecosystem there in Sydney as well as the uh, rest of Australia. Like, like, how would you is it is it hard to hire uh, tech talent? Uh, for, some, for some of the SaaS startups there, um, and you know, do you see any trends of people moving to uh, moving to SaaS? Because we do have quite a few uh, Aussies here in uh, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia uh, and in, in Singapore specifically. So um, yeah. I wondered how it was there. 
Yeah, it's um, it's definitely it's super tough. It's super competitive. Uh, the cost of being a developer here is very very high. Um, cost of living high is high as well. Um, but just because like because of wages being so high, um, especially because like the minimum wage here is like twenty six dollars an hour. So um, then you can you kind of just go up from there. Um, so it is it is quite competitive. Uh, and the thing is like, we haven't gotten it just like the investors are risk averse. We don't have enough wins on the board for the risk averse developers, um, to be willing to take, uh, you know, a chance on a startup where they, you know, potentially aren't going to go anywhere. Um, and then of course we have to, uh, we have to battle the likes of Microsoft and, um, AWS mm -hmm. and Google who come in and set up shop purely just to hire all, deve all of our de developers and then ship them off to the US. Um, what's really cool though is that uh, because of COVID and um, other reasons, we have started to see them come back. So what we love to mm -hmm. see is we ship them off to the US for a couple of years, they learn everything they need to learn and then they come on back. Um, so that has happened and that's a really good trend. Um, and actually the Australian government has started something called Advance Australia, which is to connect all of the global Aussies and ideally um, bring them home or at least start to filter some of that value back to Australia. Uh, so there, look, it's hard. I, I, I don't know if we're doing any better than any other um, country in terms of tech talent, but uh, yeah, it's definitely hard. Thank you. Three minutes left. So does any other panelist have a question for another panelist? If not, I, I think uh, I have a last question, maybe um, uh, to Cheryl exactly. So there's a company called Fast, you know, which moved from Australia to uh, US to actually build the product. So just curious, I mean, you know, uh, Australia, anyways, has uh, less number of unicorns compared to many of uh, the other uh, geographies as well. Why move to Silicon Valley? Uh, I mean, you know, tech founders moving to Silicon Valley as you know. The ecosystem in Australia is anyways booming. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> look, we lose a lot of founders. We lose a lot of startups to us. Um, several reasons. One uh, comes back to investors being risk averse. So when you're trying to raise funds and you can't raise it and you're doing well, like I had a founder email me today. They have completely doubled their forecast and he's struggling to get investment. I'm like, this is crazy. Um, so one is they can't find the money here, so they look to the U.S. And then typically U.S. investors will say, well, yeah, we're happy to invest in you, but you have to move here. So, okay, boom, now we've lost that startup. Um, the other reason is market. So Australia is a fantastic sandbox, but when you're looking for a giant market, we're not necessarily the best place. So if you're looking for a big market, it makes sense to launch your company in the U.S. So several of our startups have said, well, you know, it's great here, but it's just not a big enough market. Why would we continue operations here when our customers are all in the US? So they pick up and they move there. Um, other reasons include, uh, you know, just getting that, like, I guess, foot in the door and to go set a better structure. Um, everyone looks and sees, oh, well, everyone's incorporated in Delaware. It's like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should go be incorporated in Delaware. Um, and then I think the other reason is because when we start to look at our neighbors, I think a lot of people are intimidated by Asia. So I'm personally on a mission to uh, get us more connected to Asia so that when founders start to look elsewhere, they start to look up instead of, you know, three buildings over. Because um, the reality is that you can still have an office in Australia if you're targeting the, the arguably huge markets right next door to us um and you don't have to completely pick up and move so yeah that's why thanks all right so um i'm gonna give belinda the last word here um and before she's gonna talk about her event next week but just for everyone else um after this there is like a little networking thing you can join if, if you're gonna stay here just stay in i'm gonna activate the networking and it's a one-to-one -one, um kind of like uh, matches you with a random person so if you're not interested in that, just close out right after this. Um, otherwise, the people who are left will participate in this kind of speed networking. So Belinda, let's talk about next week's event. Thank you, Jonathan. And I'm not gonna keep you long. Um, bye, Cheryl, bye. So lovely to meet you. It's bad time for you right now. But I hope to see you at our um, Asia conference. Um, so yeah, next 
we're having our Salzburg Asia Pacific Conference. Um, last year, we had in, um, one in um, Australia, and we also had our Asia one in um, Hong Kong. We we're supposed to move to Singapore this year, but because of the situation right now, we're just going virtual. So next week, we're bringing the whole region, so not just Asia, but also Australasia, and together, we also have amazing speakers from India, from all over Asia, and some uh, also founders who are dialing in internationally. So please join us next week. Contacts are free, and um, for all access tickets, I just popped your twenty percent discount code there. And um, content tickets, as in, um, for example, um, yeah, networking is included. So yeah, join us next week. We have a workshop day on Monday, and our conference day itself is gonna be on Tuesday. All right. And um, if you have any questions, get in touch with me. And thank you so much, Jonathan, for organizing this. I hope to see you all there. Yeah, thanks for everyone who joined, including Cheryl, who just left. Um, so I'm gonna start that the networking thing. If you don't know what to say. How about you talked about one SaaS product that you use in your daily life? All right. So if anyone can think of one, you can use that as a way to start. Uh, I know some people are already leaving because they're probably really shy. Um, but I'm going to start it anyway. Up to you if you want to stay or not. All right. So good night from me. And I'm now starting the chat room. Bye-bye.